Hi. Welcome. Welcome, Peter, to the Dave and Ed podcast. Yes, we are honored to have you, you esteemed actor. Now, here's another problem. I'm going to take my hearing, hearing aids out because I'm getting an echo. Okay. Uh, great. Let me hear what happens when I take these out of my head. What do you say? Speak now. Welcome, Peter, to the Dave and Ed podcast. We are honored to have you, you esteemed actor, you. We, we didn't realize you've done so much. Here. It's an honor to be here. Thank well, you. Now that I see you, uh, uh, I remember you well from the halls of uh, the Irish Rep. Yes, indeed. Thank you. <laughs> so, Peter, we'd like to start off with, like, uh, I guess your background. Where did it all begin? Um, we believe you were born in Chicago, Illinois. My oh, of- that's such <laughs> bullshit. I'm not, from, <laughs> I'm not from Chicago at all. And when did they say I was born? <laughs> 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 It said what? you were born. 19, 1944? Yes, yeah. we could be. That's there. bullshit, too. <laughs> you must have gone on IMDb. I don't know where they get their facts or who puts that stuff in there, but okay. there's no way. I was born 1941. Wow. Okay. Upstate New York in a little town called Honeyoy Falls, <laughs> south of Rochester, New York, 17 miles south, a little farming community. Yeah. And, um, and the funny thing was, my mother was a hometown girl. Oh, what a beauty. And um, she had rejected every suitor who had come to ask for her hand. Wow. And uh, she stayed home uh, living with her mom and dad because uh, the, her dad had a bit of a problem with the... Um, and uh, right. she wanted to make sure that her mom was safe. Anyway. Into the town in 1935 comes my father, a handsome Irish actor from New York City into this little farming town. Uh-huh. And uh, they fell in love and he went, um, he went back to the city for one more uh, chance to make it big or actually make it uh, in any way. He, he wasn't having any luck. It was a depression, don't forget, the middle of the Great Depression. So he said, I'm going to um, go to New York and give it one more year. And if I don't succeed, I'm going to come back here and I want to marry you and we'll have a family. I'll live here. So he did. He came to New York. He worked at the World's Fair in uh, uh, at that time in uh, 1939. And uh, nothing really happened for him work wise. And so we came back to this little town, and he and his mo- he and my mother got married, and um, and then he came back and settled down there in this town. But he never stopped acting, and he never stopped directing and writing and designing. He did the whole thing. He started his own uh, um, community theater there in the town, you know, amateur, yeah. and he was the boss, and he directed it, and he did it for the rest of his life almost, you know. And um, so I grew up uh, uh, at my father's side. I was the oldest of five kids. Uh-huh. And uh, uh, I just, I knew very early on that I wanted to be an actor. Yeah. And uh, I learned everything I learned about uh, stage decorum <laughs> from my father. Lessons that I wish the younger generation would take to heart. <laughs> We agree, absolutely. Uh, you know, could you give, could you uh, give examples of those lessons? Yes. So I was a, I was a, uh, uh, for my father's company, when I was about 11 years old, I was a call boy and I would go and knock on the doors of the dressing rooms and say, half hour? Yes. And I would uh, call them by their, uh, or their names. I would say, half hour, Mr. Harrington, even though I knew him in the town as Don, I would call him by his last name. Right. Respect, respect. Yes. And um, and I've been looking for someone to respect me ever since. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I learned how to stage manage. My father designed the sets for the play that he directed and I helped him paint the set. So I took after him and I knew that I wanted to be an actor from a very early age. And that was it, you know. Um, that was it for me. I always knew, and it's very lucky for a guy to know what he wants to do, because a lot of people just are lost. They don't, right? They see too many possibilities, and they can't choose, or they, you know, it's just 
unusual to know from a very young age what your destiny is. Right. Yeah. So, um, uh, I, uh, as the oldest, you know, I went to college at Syracuse and I uh, uh, never got off the stage those four years. I was on stage day and night. It was, it was a wonderful experience. Although I had to unlearn a lot. I had to unlearn all the bad things that I, I that, that, that they tried to teach me at, at this uh, school right. in terms of how to act, you know what I mean? I was a good, good at getting everybody's attention. Right, yeah. And um, pandering would be a kind word to use for the kind of things I used to do. I would do anything to get the laugh, you know. I mean, I was a, com a comedian, a comic actor. Right. And so, uh, you know, I, I was good at getting laughs. Mm -hmm. But as far as acting, I'm talking about serious acting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I had to uh, unlearn a lot of bad habits and I had to uh, learn how to do it right. So after four years there, I came to New York and uh, wondered where all the banners were that were supposed to be welcoming me to the profession. Right. Well, nobody cared about me. And so I was a stage manager as well. See, that was what was smart. Yes. Uh, not smart, but it, it was lucky that it happened that I had learned from my father how to stage manage, how to run a backstage, how to keep a stage clean, yeah. mm -hmm. how to organize props. So when you're coming on stage, you know where your prop is. Right. It's not going to not be there because I was responsible. So I, I alternated stage managing and acting for uh, seven years, uh, my, my first seven years in New York, um, until... After doing the fourth play of a writer named Louis John Carlino, he took me to lunch and he said, look, you, 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 you keep saying you want to act, but as long as you stage manage, you're not going to do it because you're a good stage manager and people are going to hire you and you're never going to be out of work. Right. And you know, you get used to the money, yeah. um, right. such as it is. Yeah. And so uh, I took that to heart and I never stage managed again. And then I didn't work for six months, of course. Yeah. So, uh, but eventually I started getting jobs, you know, and um, um, and I went to. Um, you I would alternate acting and stage managing, you know, and and the stage managing was great because I sat next to directors. Yeah. Many directors. Yes. Great ones. Many names. Very few. Good ones, the majority, yeah. and dreadful ones. Name names. Uh, directors? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, you wouldn't know them, but the, the, most, the, the most influential one that I worked for was uh, Arthur Penn. Oh. Was, uh, at one point, he had five Broadway shows running simultaneously. It was oh. back in the... Um, mid 60s mm -hmm. and uh, I worked for him and um, that was the life-changing experience for me. Uh, I had learned some some wonderful things from my college teachers from a few of them. Most of them were not so good but a few of them were absolutely wonderful and um, I'm a good student by that I mean I love education and I still look at myself as a student. And the wonderful thing about the theater, I tell people who could be looked on as my students, I tell them, you know, the wonderful thing about the theater is you never stop learning. Every job is a new opportunity to find out something you didn't know before. Right. You know, about other people, other cultures, um, other uh, periods of history. So um, I'm a good student, but I also have an absolute, um, great talent as an apple polisher right as a uh, um, uh, a man who knows how to please the teacher okay uh, yeah uh, i was a, i got wonderful grades in school not because i was so brilliant but because i knew how to how to do things right do right. things that the teacher would uh, appreciate yeah you know, and always got good grades what? So, but Arthur Penn was the first person, the first director who um, showed me what acting could be and showed me how powerful the actor could be. Uh -huh. um, 
and how creative the actor could be and what a contribution the actor could make to any production and how the, 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 play, the, the actor could show the playwright things that the playwright never imagined when he was writing the play. Yeah. You know, so at that point, uh, that was a huge lesson for me. I acted for him and I stage managed for him. Right. And uh, George Tabori, that same summer of 1966, he also was an absolutely crucial, crucial influence on me. He was a Hungarian Jewish man of, of great um, uh, wisdom and uh, expertise. He had worked with Brecht. And um, from these two guys in the summer of 66, they, they changed my life without question. And then at the end of um, that summer of 66, Arthur Penn, um, I finished work with him and he came up to me at, at the closing night party and he said, what are you go doing next? And I said, I, I'm going to Yale to a stage manager show. And he said, well, don't sign a contract until you talk to me. So I said, okay. And my wife and I, my, my then wife and I went to, back to New York and uh, went to the pay phone because my, my New York apartment phone hadn't been turned on yet and cell phones weren't invented. And I uh, went to the pay phone on the corner and I called his office, Arthur's office, and I got his secretary and she said, oh, Arthur's in California. I said, well, he re I, I'm being pressured to sign a contract. And he, he uh, told me not to sign a contract until I talked to him. So I, she said, all right, let me see if I can get him out. You hang on and I'll try to get him out in California. So a few minutes went fast. And uh, he, uh, after a few minutes, a voice came on the phone and said, this is Peter. I said, yes. He said, this is Warren Beatty. All right. I said, oh, hi. <laughs> and, uh, so he said, Arthur is sitting here with me and telling me about the work you did with him last, this past summer. And we're going to be making a movie together. Uh, it's a gangster picture. And we wondered whether you would be free to come to Texas for three months to work on it with us. And I said, yeah, um, absolutely. And um, they hired me to be the casting director and dialogue coach on location for the movie Bonnie and Clyde. Wow. So, you know, we didn't know it was going to be a, a, a huge yeah. success. And in fact, it wasn't a success at the beginning. It was. Right. It's a classic, though. It was a failure. I mean, it was a failure. And they pulled it from the theaters, and the critics hated it, right. the influential critics. Um, but eventually, uh, Warren Beatty uh, turned the thing around and, and had it re. They redesigned the advertising campaign and um, uh, reissued the film, you right. know, put it back in the theaters, and it, it, it just became this phenomenon. So it was very fortunate to be connected with that movie, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, I still wanted to be an actor. Sure. And I, uh, they wanted me to go to California and be a an assistant director uh -huh. uh, join the uh, there's a, a program that the Directors Guild has where they train you as an assistant director. And I almost I almost signed the papers, but I knew that I wanted to act. Right, right. And I didn't think that that was that. I said, what's going to happen is the same thing that my playwright friend warned about. I'll, I'll get making money. I'll work all the time, and um, I won't be happy creatively. You know what I mean? I don't yeah, want to. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like assistant directing in the movies is like stage management times five, you know, in terms of right. the amount of work that has to be done. Mm -hmm. Right, sure. Of a certain kind. And I was not really interested in that. So I said no. Sure. And um, so then I came back to New York and then same, I'm a very lucky person. Yeah. And uh, I, we came back to New York, and uh, the same friend who, uh, who who connected with me for my first job as a stage manager in New York, call, uh, I called him and I said, "I'm so sorry, I had to turn down the Yale job, yeah. uh, which he had he had um, engineered for me." 
But uh, I just came back from doing this movie and he said, well, what are you doing tonight? And I said, well, we're just unpacking. He says, well, why don't you and Ellen, that was my wife then, he said, well, why don't you uh, go down to Soho tonight because they're having a workshop. Uh, the open theater, Joseph Chicken is having a workshop uh, for actors. So we went down there that night to Soho and we participated in this improvisation, this improvisation workshop, you, uh, doing things we'd never done before. A lot of physical work, uh, uh, sound and movement, um, strange things to me because I'd never been exposed to this. Well, I never left that theater for four years. I stayed with that theater. I never worked outside it. Um, and that too became, we became, although we had no money, um, we became uh, very famous. Yeah. And for four years, I did the avant-garde theater. Um, and that was the beginning with Joseph Chaikin, who was our director. That was also the beginning of, of my political education, uh -huh. my political awareness. Because okay. I had none. Right. I really didn't. I mean, I'd never uh, been in a protest, you know, uh, the war in Vietnam was was uh, happening, but nobody really knew it, its impact. And nobody really knew uh, that it was, a, a large part of it was based on a, a lie. Sure. Uh, and America, we were in America at that time. We were, we were, I to, let me put it this way. We were an innocent country right? Yeah. because we had bravely gone to war against, finally gone to war after we got bombed against uh, the forces of tyranny. And we had triumphed and we had won. Right, right. And we were heroes to the world. And everything was fine, the, the economy, and uh, everything seemed simple, a kind of black and white. Right. And then, um, but that was the end of that. And, and things began to come out about what was being done in Vietnam. And uh, this was the political atmosphere, the fermenting uh, years of, protest they were starting to just come to fruition i have to say and i was learning every day about this we were learning about this so suddenly i'm interested in in politics mm -hmm. in a way that i never had been before yeah about people of color about other people i mean i never even saw a black person until i went to college okay you know? and uh so I, so we were innocent. Well, we stopped being innocent, you know, and we started putting ourselves on the line, protesting the war, protesting the draft, how to keep young men from going to be in the army in Vietnam yeah. and uh, sit down in front of the draft center and try to stop it, get, get lifted into a police van by policemen and taken to the tombs downtown in New York and fingerprinted and photographed and stay all night overnight uh, in the jail because we believed that the war was wrong. So this was all very, very new to us and um, to some, most of us. And uh, it was very exciting too, you know, for one thing, we had something to fight against. Yeah. You know, it's always good to have a, <clears throat> Excuse me, an unjust war to fight against. Sure. Sure. You know, gives you something to do. Yeah. You know. Peter, uh, what was your first impression of New York City when you moved from? Well, no, I thought it was like the 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 the, the uh, wonderful land of Oz. Okay. I can remember coming uh, in the bus uh, from um, from the western New York, where I'm from. Yeah. And coming across New Jersey and seeing the, uh, the, the skyline in the distance across the river. Yeah. And, I, and my heart just started uh, beating 
because that was my dream. My dream was to live and work in New York City. Right. And, and here I was, I was going to do it, you know. Yeah. And I came to New York with a hundred bucks in my pocket. That's all I'd been able to save for my summer stock job. I was a stage manager in summer stock. And I, uh, uh, so I had a hundred dollars in my pocket. That's all I had. Right. And I stayed overnight a few nights with a friend uh, who'd been in New York for a year ahead of me. And uh, well, I got a job three days after I was in New York as a stage manager in a wonderful oh, play called Mr. Johnson, mm -hmm. starring uh, James Earl Jones. Oh. And nobody had ever heard of him yet. Yeah, right. He had just made the movie. Um, uh, Dr. Strangelove, but it hadn't been issued yet, you know, right. so uh, that was good right. and then halfway through that job, which paid nothing, that was a showcase in 1963, um, halfway through that job I got a call from a wonderful man and he uh, had met me in summer, uh, summer stock, we met each other in summer stock and he, um, he said, well, uh, would you like a job, a stage managing a new show that's going to open off Broadway? And I said, yes, uh, I would. And so I started doing that. And that show ran six months. Cool. And I moved out of this temporary housing and a friend of mine from college and I uh, rented an apartment. Um, uh, had five rooms and a bath on the Lower East Side, um, uh, the uh, East Village, I, I, I should say. Yeah. And I always say to my son, who now lives in Burbank, California, I always say to my son, I don't know what's wrong with you. When I was your age, I had a five room apartment, five room apartment on the, in the, the Lower East Side, five rooms and a bath. And um, I paid $67 and 50 cents a month. <laughs> uh, uh, I said, what's wrong with you? I'm paying $900 per room. You know, <laughs> he would get mad at me, you know, put his arms or hands around my throat and throw me onto the floor. Uh, <laughs> so so yes. irritated. irritated. You, uh, you also, you worked with uh, Brian De Palma on De Niro, right? On Greetings? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was 1960, uh, around 1967. Right. Um, well, I was, yes, I was in a... Um, I was in an unemployment line huh. uh, and uh, a man came up to me and asked me if I would uh, like to do a picture for him. That was uh, Robert Downey Sr. Oh, yes. And the film was Putney Swope. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was a, a satirical comedy, a wild ride. And it's still out there. It's, I think, the Criterion Collection. Uh, okay publishes it now. It's it's a, a wonderful, wild satire. Absolutely wild. Its motto, I think, if I remember it properly, is, is there anyone here I haven't offended yet? <laughs> that was his, uh, his yeah. raison. And um, so I did that movie. I think maybe I got $50 a day for that. It was non-union, of course. And then I'm not sure how I got the Brian De Palma film. I did two with De Niro. One was called Greetings, which was, I think, Brian De Palma's second uh, film. Right. And, uh, and then after that, I did uh, Hi Mom. Oh, Hi Mom. Also with De Niro. Yeah. Um, I think we got paid $25 a day. That was non-union, of course. Hmm. And if, there, if you had to have a reshoot of a scene, you didn't get another $25. Okay. Wow. And there was only enough film to shoot one take of any angle. So you better get it right the first time. Wow. And, uh, but it was a lot of fun. But, and, and again, uh, how we did those movies in terms of the script, there was an outline, you know, there was a scenario, but the night before we worked, we would go to the producer's apartment, Chuck Hirsch was the producer, and we would sit in his apartment and they would set up a situation. Peter, you're the pharmacist. Bob, you are the guy that wants to buy uh, condoms. It, it, but in those days, you, you didn't you know, do it openly. You were kind of embarrassed if you tried to buy 
uh, uh, condoms. Uh, they weren't hanging there next to you as you paid, you know, your bill. <laughs> so, um, so I play a, a, a pharmacist who is kind of uh, obsessed with sex toys. And um, it was um, very fun, uh, pretty funny, you know, it was pretty hard to not laugh uh, while you were doing it. Mm -hmm. But but it was a lot of fun and great to do. But so, so they would give you the situation and then you would improvise it. Right. And they would tape record it. Mm -hmm. Then you would leave after you did that a few a few times, you know, and then they would take the best of those improvs and edit them down and type up a script based on the best things that happened during the improv. And the next morning you would get the script on the set. Wow. Wow. The words that you improvised, but edit it down, you know. So, uh, so you quick learn those words in order and get up and do them. That well, was the way we. What was De Niro like to work with? How did you? Well, you knew. You just knew. He was wonderful, wonderful, and you just knew. He's one of those people that you just knew was uh, had a certain greatness in him that you had no idea what what it was going to turn out to be or. Right. how it would emerge but there was no question about that he was um, something really special as an actor really good right. really good right so those were the first films um i guess an occasional tv show if i remember correctly but my main focus uh at that time was this avant-garde theater group right right and we had no money. We paid three dollars a month uh, for to rent the loft. Each of us had to contribute out of our own pockets to rent the loft where we rehearsed and where we created our own stage works. Mm -hmm. And then we were invited to go to Italy in the summer of '68, and we went across on the SS France. Uh, 20 some, uh, 20 some actors and children, and um, we went across on, the, on the, this big ocean liner. Oh. And from France, we went down to Rome, and we premiered the play in Rome at the Teatro dell'Arte there. And then we went on to play 16 cities in Italy. Went up down one side of the country, up the other side of the country. In six weeks, we played 16 cities there. Yeah. In English, and they the audiences didn't have uh, English, but we were very you know all that stuff that I mentioned doing with our um, our teacher Lee Warling down in Soho in the open theater workshops. That's the way we worked, and that's the, the show. The shows we did depended less on the English language than they did on sound and movement. Right. Right. Know. So uh, I did that for four years with this group, and we got famous after being in Europe for six months. We came back and we got grants. Finally, we had some money, yeah. um, not much, mm -hmm. and um, I stayed with that group until 1970. Did right. you? Did you? Enjoy and then I started writing. Right. Oh yes. And then I started directing at that time. Uh huh. But uh, about Italy, did you enjoy your time in Italy? Have you any memories of it, of Italy? Of Italy? Yeah, have you got lots of good Yeah, so I get to Bar Bari, Italy. Bari is over on the um, east coast. Right, yes. In the south. We played in Sicily. That was where they were the greatest audiences we had were in Sicily, and they really didn't understand English. They right. were extremely receptive. It was absolutely wonderful. Yes, I have very strong memories of Italy. Um, uh, we got paid $12 a day. If we worked, okay. If we didn't work, you didn't get the twelve dollars. And we had a, a euro, a euro, was it euro rail, euro rail pass, so we could go anywhere we wanted on the on the. Oh um, uh, yeah. Okay. On the, on the pass, you know, on the train, and um, so we had twelve dollars, and we had to, you know, buy, and we had our our rooms in the various cities paid for, uh, and with our twelve dollars, we had to buy our meals. So it was a, a, a not-for-profit enterprise, for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Um, but I remember the, the political consciousness of the Italian young people 
uh, was quite striking. They were very, you know, we were coming with this, with a, with our fairly young political consciousness, mm -hmm. and it was represented in our work, in the pieces that we had created and were presenting. Um, and so they 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 stormed our theaters. I mean, they broke the doors down to the theater to get in to see what we were doing. Wow, and I was very impressed by their, their excitement that we were there. And I was very impressed by their frustration politically, the young people. Because Italy, as you know, is a kind of country that loses its government, gets a new government, loses yeah. its government back and forth, back and forth. Stability is not really uh, the, the, the word for the Italian government. And the young people felt very frustrated. And I remember very well being in a, in a fancy house because of course the rich people who can afford to um, have the best seats in the theater um, to watch us perform, uh, they would have parties afterwards for us. And there we would come a bunch of hippies, you know, right. with long hair and beads and sandals. Um, and they would, you know, feed us lavish meals. Right. And half the audience would come too. And uh, half the time we'd come and the food would be all gone. That's sort of like a joke, as you know, by the time you get your costume off, you yeah. get to the party and all the food's gone. Well, thanks a lot, you know. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed my performance. <laughs> <laughs> and one guy, one young man talking to me in the kitchen of this place, says, uh, talking about the house and the money, the, the money that the people had, he reaches up and he takes a, a beautiful plate off the, which is on display above the stove. And he says, you know what I think of this? You know what I think of this? And he throws the plate to the floor and it smashes into a thousand pieces. And I said, holy cow, this guy is pissed off and he doesn't know what to do. He has no outlet for, yes. his, for his rage. Yes. You know? So I was impressed by that. Uh, in Bari, Italy, on the on the uh, other coast, uh, right near our hotel, uh, was a little movie theater. And what were they showing? But Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, <laughs> nice. So I went up to the um, box office and I said, "Could I speak to the manager?" I don't speak Italian, but I made myself relatively clear. And she went and got the manager, and he came, and I said. I managed to tell him that I worked on this movie. I, I, I couldn't say casting director in Italian, so I said, uh, Direttore, Direttore Secundo. Right. <laughs> yeah. The second director. I didn't right, know what yeah. to say. Oh, they opened the doors, embraced me, put me in a seat in the box, an armchair in a box overlooking the screen, brought me espresso while I watched the movie. Ah, nice. It was hilariously <laughs> dubbed because they don't do subtitles in Italy because um, so many people uh, don't read. Don't read, okay, uh, okay, okay. Uh, yeah. in, the, in the more, um, in the less, um, how can I say it? Uh, the less developed areas of the country, you know what I mean, where the farmers are, where the poor people are, they just don't have the uh, education. Yeah. And so they, they dub everything. So there was all my characters from Bonnie and Clyde speaking these Italian uh, lines uh, yeah. in Italian voices. It was hysterical. It was a great experience. And of course, our play, the, the play that we first came to Italy with, was a play called The Serpent, and it was based on our study of uh, the book of Genesis in the Bible. Oh, wow. Our intention was to create an imaginary life of Jesus Christ, those years when we don't know anything about him. Oh, yes, those missing years. The, yeah, yeah. However many, 13, however many years there are there before his crucifixion, you know, his, his, we don't know much about him. So we were going to make up the whole thing. Well, we started out in the book of Genesis, and it was so interesting to us. 
we never got out of the book of Genesis in a year yeah. of work. Okay. So our play that we ended up with after almost a year was uh, called The Serpent. We called it The Serpent. And it dealt with God, rules, do not eat the apple, do not eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and questioning why. Why? Yeah. Why is God trying to keep this from us? You know, what happens when we do eat the apple? We gain the knowledge, we lose our innocence. Yes. And this is what's happening with, with, we saw it as reflected in what's happening across the world with the war and, and the uh, yes. desire of people to defy authority, yeah. you know, anti-tyranny. So uh, one of the scenes that we had in The, in the Serpent was what we sometimes call the begetting scene, when after they, Adam and Eve get exiled from the garden, they have the boys, Cain and Abel, we show the murder of Abel by Cain, the first murder. Yeah. And, um, and then the descendants of Adam and Eve, they, they, we show them just uh, having, the, the human tree growing, the, the connection of, of, of the first time they had sex mm -hmm. and they, they, all these people are born with desire, but they have no idea how to do it. So the scene essentially, the begatting scene was um, 14 people on stage trying to make sexual connection. Wow. Okay. And so we, we're wearing clothes, you know, we, we were not very big on nudity. I was nude in several pieces that we did. Uh -huh. and the director's sister was nude in, in, in the same pieces. How did you feel and about that? Sometimes I got in some trouble for, for that. Right. But we, we were all dressed in rehearsal clothes. Uh -huh. And so we're, we're essentially fornicating on the stage, wow. wearing our clothes uh -huh. and trying to find connection, sexual connection, but not knowing how to do it. So everybody's trying different positions. I mean, it was hilarious. <laughs> it was hilarious. And Rome has a treaty with the Vatican. Nothing may be shown that the Vatican doesn't approve of. Oh, yeah. So yeah. there was, on, on the ship coming over as we rehearsed, we tried to find an alternative to this scene, which we thought might get us in trouble. You know, or we have to do something. If we want to present the scene, if, to make them let us, mm -hmm. we have to find something. Well, we couldn't, we couldn't come up with anything that didn't seem utterly ridiculous. So we, so we open in Rome with a scene. When we get to, now we, we privately called it the fucking scene. <laughs> and so there we are on stage in this beautiful little theater, the Teatro dell'Arte. And I mean, it was as beautiful as Charlotte and Kieran's theater is it had been created with that kind of care it was that kind of handsome beautiful atmosphere <clears throat> and there we are <clears throat> on the stage doing the fucking scene we start the fucking scene <clears throat> and suddenly cigarette lighters light up all over the audience in the audience <laughs> on the back of every seat is an ashtray it's, it's a metal ashtray in the back of the seat in front of you and they take out their cigarettes and they light the, light the cigarettes and they're nervously smoking while we're up there yeah trying to make sexual connection uh. there's one fireman backstage in military uniform big sign on the back wall via tato fumare no smoking and he is looking through the curtains while we're doing the fucking scene he can't believe what he's seeing one fireman backstage. The second night, there were 11 firemen backstage. Right. Because he'd gone back to the firehouse and told them, and they all came out, brought his buddies to watch the scene. So it was very memorable. That was a very memorable moment. Yeah. Wow. What, what are you, go ahead, jumping, yeah. ju jumping back to Bonnie and Clyde for a yeah. second, um, did you work closely with BT and uh, um, Gene Hackman? With who? With uh, Gene Hackman and, and Warren Beatty. Uh, 
I mainly worked, my job during those three months, here's the, the thing that got left out of my narrative at the beginning was that Arthur, in the summer of the play, the, one of the reasons I got hired right. was he wanted to use local people in the show that we were putting on. We were putting on The Skin of Our Teeth by Thornton Wilde. Oh. And uh, there's a few scenes in that play which have crowds in them. And he wanted to use local people from the town where he lived, which is Stockbridge, Massachusetts, where the theater was. And he wanted to use local people. And um, so early in rehearsal, he gave me the job. I was his stage manager, but he, he also gave me the job of working with the local people at night after our rehearsals were over. So I worked with the local people. We had about 20 of them. Many, many people wanted to be in the show. We chose 20. And uh, it was my job to rehearse them. And so I set up improvs with them uh -huh. uh, on the stage after our work was done, our main work was done every day. And so we developed behavior, uh, which was proper to the scenes that I'm talking about. And then uh, when it came down to it, you know, of course, Arthur took these people who I had uh, worked with yeah. and he put them where he wanted them on the stage. Right. So that's why they, they, uh, he wanted to do the same thing with Bonnie and Clyde. He wanted to use local, real people. Mm -hmm. So there were nine principals in the movie and all the other people were found by me. So I drove thousands and thousands of miles over the days, every day in my car, to the little towns where we were going to be shooting. And we put out a casting call and these amateurs or, or just ordinary people would show up. Mm -hmm. And I would take uh, Polaroid pictures of them and then uh, make notes and, and see who might be right for what small part. Yeah. And I would go back to Arthur at night and show him the, um, the photographs. And he would say, this person possible, this person possible. And then I would bring them in to him and he would meet them and he would choose them. Then I would be responsible for making sure they learned their lines yeah. and showed up on time. Right. Okay. They would have to drive from their town perhaps to a different location. Yeah. Um, so um, why did I go back to that? I asked you, and this, and this was all. Oh yeah. So you asked me if I spent time with. So you know, Warren. This is Warren's first uh, uh, production right. as a producer. Right. And he was so beautiful, a man. Uh, his his visage. He yeah. was So beautiful. It's almost a liability. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to imagine. Uh, you know, we know we know how successful he was with the women uh, mm -hmm. all his life, but it's almost like a liability to be that beautiful. A, uh, uh, a specimen right and so um, he wanted to show his intelligence he wanted to show his ability his strength um, his vision and so there was no hanging out with Warren I mean uh, he, he and uh, Arthur worked very hard together to uh, to agree on, on what this film should be, how the scene should work. What are we doing tomorrow? What's your vision of it? How are you going to accomplish that? And um, so you didn't hang out in that sense. Right. Um, I remember Gene Hackman took uh, my, my wife and I to uh, dinner, took us out to dinner uh, the night before we, we left to come back east, and, which was a lovely uh, event. For us, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, do you remember what you had? Everybody to couldn't have been friendlier. Everybody, it was a wonderful experience to be on this oh, movie. Right. Sure. sure. Do you remember what you had for dinner that night? It was a um, Middle Eastern uh, restaurant with a, a man looking like Lawrence of Arabia, with with a robe, beautiful robe, going down to the floor. I remember it was orange. And he had that scarf on his head with the thing holding it on. You know what I mean? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And as we left the restaurant, he was the host. As we left the restaurant, with belly, there were belly dancers. 
yeah. you know, women gyrating mm -hmm. right in your face, and you sat on cushions, and you didn't have silverware. You used um, pita bread to scoop the food. Yeah. And uh, it was just like being in Lawrence of Arabia. And as we left the restaurant to say goodbye to Jean and thanks very much, this guy, this tall guy looking like Omar Sharif, <laughs> leans down to us and with a smile says, y'all come back and see us now. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. That's fantastic. Yeah. Just to, yeah. to go back to the, ser the serpent um, play show that you created, um, the question came to me when you were describing it, Peter, what are, your, what are your beliefs around God? About God? Yeah. Well, you know, I was raised Catholic, and I loved the church when I was a boy. I, I, um, there were two priests who I had uh, over me, and they were both, thank God, uh, uh, good men yeah. who yes. never laid a hand on me. I never had to worry about any kind of um, uh, that, that awful damaging impropriety that can, uh, you know, um, uh, shrivel your soul forever. Indeed. For yeah. the rest of your life. That's not all that can shrivel. And so uh, I consider myself extremely lucky. Um, my father was very active in the church. He was a, a, a good Catholic until Vatican II when he stopped going to Mass because he, he resented so much the loss of the Latin Mass. And all my brothers and I were, were altar boys. So, but the other thing, my father needed to earn a living. Uh, you know, he had to ra pay for the expenses of a family of seven people. Mm -hmm. And um, so they had five kids, which might indicate that, they're ca that he was Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, I guess that was a large family cons uh, compared to most in the town. We had a lovely little church, the St. Paul of the Cross. And um, so my father, who was a great Irish tenor, sang the mass, the high mass. In those days, you could have a high mass every day for the soul of some departed loved one. So you paid $5, I think, to have a high mass said for the person who died, mm -hmm. you know. So every day was a high mass. Oh, right. And my father sang the responses in Latin from the choir loft every day. Mondays, I served on the altar. Tuesdays, David served on the altar. Wednesdays, Michael, you go on and on until the children are, you know, the five of us. And then on Sundays, often all of us would be on the altar. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, most of us redheads and all the late old ladies in the congregation would smile and nod and, and they'd oh, say to me as I after I finished raking the leaves or mowing their lawns they'd say oh Peter I pray that you get the call mm -hmm. I said get the call yes you know that you become a priest you'd make a beautiful priest <laughs> they'd say yeah. And um, so I, I love the church. I love the, I love the theatricality of it. I love the music and the, the uh, when I was a head altar boy, you know, I was in charge of the, the incense, you know, in the processions. I liked all that. I liked, I wasn't particularly pious, but neither was my father. And sometimes there'd be nobody in the church except one old Italian lady, all in black, uh, sitting there while the priest on the altar, me or one of my brothers serving the mass and my father in the choir loft singing the Latin yeah. responses. So, wow. you know, as I say, I had said that, that that time, I was born in a time of, of unbelievable innocence uh, and um, helped my father put up the creche at Christmas in the church, you know. He was a, a member of the Holy Name Society, the men who do what has to be done uh, where the church was concerned. So I loved it. I, I, I loved it. But I, I went away to college and stopped it pretty much right away. Right. Fell in love with the first Jewish woman I met. And, um, 
ended up marrying the second Jewish woman I met. Okay. And uh, what was it like being part of a Jewish family? And the Jewish? Yeah. What was it? What was that like being married to a Jewish lady? I mean, like, was it? Um, well, it was uh, very, uh, you know, exotic because I knew I had never known a Jewish person before, and okay. uh, the, the one woman who I was first attracted to. Um, turned out to be with somebody else. And, um, but the second one ended up being my wife. And, um, you know, we acted together in the, in the, in the drama department. And um, she took me to synagogue once. Mm -hmm. And uh, I took her to the, the Catholic church on campus once. They were both very disappointing experiences. Okay. And, um, it was um, it was a very feisty relationship, you know, because we come from two different uh, environments and different worlds and different beliefs, um, and that's what I was after, you know. I, I I think ultimately, whatever the problems were, and we were together for twenty years. I think uh, uh, the struggle was a meaningful one, even though it was. Um, often painful, uh -huh. sometimes bloody. Right. Um, but I think I always looked at it, or I looked at it finally in the end result as something that we needed to um, be part of. Yeah. You yeah. know, it was difficult. It was very often difficult. Mm -hmm. And my wife and I were, were, you know, in this theater company for four years and we never, for four years, we never, we almost were never out of each other's sight. Right. We lived together, slept together, ate together, went to work together, worked all day together, went on the road together, flew together, yeah. performed in Europe or wherever together. You know, it was up. It was, uh, that, that's hard. That's hard to be always with someone, you know, especially someone, uh, you know, I'm an accommodator and I'm a, you know, if you did something uh, to me that I didn't approve, or if I saw you do something that, 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 that I didn't approve, I would not say anything. Okay. Nice. You know, and, um, but I might treasure the memory. Yeah. yeah. And bring it bring it up to you about 15 years later so <laughs> right. you know you wouldn't know what i was talking about yes but she was of a, of, of a mindset and the type of a person who before you got the offending sentence out of your mouth would punch you in the face i mean she okay. would Sorry. she would never wait to express her um uh -huh. her anger and it was often uh, righteous anger. It was also, you know, the the um, you know the action, whatever it was, may have been well deserved. You know, right. I don't mean I'm not trying to be uh, condemnatory of her and her her way. She was an incredibly talented uh, person, actress, writer, and director. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And as an up and coming actor in the 60s and 70s, were, were there any actors you really admired at the time and you wanted to emulate? You know, it's a great, exciting time. Mm -hmm. Sam Shepard and I came to New York the same year. Wow. And um, I don't know where he lived. I can't remember where he lived, but, you know, we, we certainly worked in the same theaters and in the same neighborhood. And um, so imagine his writing was absolutely um, exciting. I mean, it was yeah. Yeah. not what anybody else was doing. Right. You know, uh, he wrote monologues of great length, which a lot of people thought should be shorter. And it took him many years to come to the conclusion that some of those monologues were too long. <laughs> you know, he, he didn't really, he wasn't really a rewriter. 
or a particularly good editor of his works. It didn't matter because the works were rough and they were engaging. Yes. And were made you sit up and listen, you know. Yes. And um, it was very thrilling to know him and to work with him. And, um, you know, the off, off Broadway movement. I spoke to you, I mentioned my, my first off Broadway show lasted six months. And I did a number of off Broadway shows over the years, but the off, off Broadway show, uh, the off, off Broadway movement was just a starting at that time. Uh, you know, off Broadway, we're talking about um, uh, the Iceman Cometh, you know, at the Circle in the Square Theater with Peter Falk as the bartender. Wow. Yeah. Uh, we're talking wow. about um, uh, that Tennessee Williams play, um, with, which I can't remember the name of it right this minute. Uh, with uh, Geraldine Page, and Geraldine Page was so brilliant in the part she was making fifty dollars a week. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was off Broadway at the time. Mm -hmm. For my six month job as a stage manager on this play by Louis John Carlino called Telemachus Clay, the one that ran for six months, um, I took home after taxes forty eight dollars a week for six months. Right. And every week I had to borrow $5 from the company manager and every week I would pay it back. So it was like a revolving $5 loan, which I just could not get out from under. <laughs> you know, it sounds ludicrous now yeah. when I talk to young people about it, you know, but on the other hand, I had a very cheap apartment and most people did. Right. Right. Um, so the exciting time of off, off Broadway is not to be, uh, dismissed i mean it was it was really shoestring theater and people just from the desire the urge to express yeah to not have to deal with unions i'm a union man I, i've been a member of three unions since 1960 you know and i believe in unions and i believe in the protection that a union can offer uh, a worker um but you know, those four years for the open theater, I was already a union member. They never questioned us being part of this non-union company. Yeah. I think the reason that they never questioned it was they, they, they didn't see an exploiter. There was no one exploiting us. Right. We were exploiting ourselves. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Maybe, you know, uh, we shared and shared alike. We divided the money. Uh, Right. So they never raised a question yeah. in those four years that I was there. They never said, Peter, what are you doing? You're a union member and you're, you're here with this uh, bunch of hippies and you're not getting paid properly, you know. Right. Um, so but th there's a great freedom in that, in not having anybody with rules. Yeah. You, know, you don't have to take a, mm -hmm. uh, a break. You have to stop rehearsal now because otherwise... We have to pay overtime or yeah. right. all those things yeah. which are meant to protect us and often do protect us. But when you're free of them for a while, it's a great exhilarating situation. Well, I guess it's a double edged sword, you know, what? it's a double edged sword, you know. Yeah, yeah. right, right. Yeah, I, it, can, I, it can be bad. And did you know Sam Shepard personally? I did. Yeah. And uh, what kind of a man was he? He was, um, for all the words that he put into his characters, he was quite reticent. He was uh, very, he didn't, uh, he didn't talk a lot. He was, you know, as you know, uh, he was incredibly um, handsome, mm -hmm. yeah. quietly charismatic, you know, tall, rangy, you know, yeah. California guy who, I mean, we, we weren't uh, uh, intimate friends, but um, he was great, you know. For, for decades, he had bad teeth and he just refused to fix them. Mm -hmm. You know, refused. Right. Even in the early days of his Hollywood career, when he suddenly became this movie star, he wouldn't fix those teeth. <laughs> I think in the end of his life, towards the end of his life, he did fix them. Right. 
um, we, we, he was, uh, we, we worked with him for a short time as a, uh, he and Joe Chaikin, Joe was our director of the Open Theater, and he and Joe Chaikin were extremely close. And uh, there was a love between these two guys that was just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. uh, a love in the work. And um, they, even after Joe had a, a massive stroke, while having open heart surgery and, and was aphasic. You, you could barely understand the word that he said, and yet he never stopped directing. And you just sort of oh, zero in on him and try to say, what? Mm -hmm. What are you saying to me? What? What do you want me to do? And he would say, Peter, Peter, dancing, dancing. <laughs> Good. Now, oh, then, then, shift, shift, okay. shift. Wow. Okay. You know, you'd go and try to figure out what the hell that meant. <laughs> you know, and you would, either you would figure it out right, in which case he would be happy. Yes, now then, it was hard, it was hard. Well, Sam and Joe had this connection and they wrote, you know, they wrote together and performed together these pieces after Joe's um, stroke. And um, it was a, it was a, a wonderful, moving thing to see how these guys could be um, still doing theater. How how Joe could still be doing theater, he never stopped. Right. Right to the end, he never stopped, okay. despite the. Um, Do, could we talk a bit about uh, the movie Capone? That you did in 1975. Oh. Ben Gazzara and uh, directed by James Kahn. John Casablanca. You played, of course, uh, Jake Guzik. I, I played him. Jake. Yes, Greasy Thumb Guzik. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not a very good movie, I think. And uh, but I tell you, um, I was on the road for a year with Ben Gazzara doing the O'Neill play oh. Huey. Oh yeah, tell us about Ben Gazzara, fascinating man. I'm sorry? Tell us about Ben Gazzara. We're very interested to hear about what Well, I, I loved him. Uh, he was, uh, I thought he was brilliant in the play. We did the play uh, for a year. Chicago, Miami, St. Louis, uh, LA. Mm -hmm. um, and then we came to Broadway. And sadly, after very success, great success on the road, with rave reviews for us both, uh, when we came to Broadway, the Broadway critics, you know, they don't like to be told that somebody in Chicago thought you were brilliant. You know, they, they right. say, uh, I'll be the one to decide that, Mr. Maloney. Yeah. You know, so we got hurt bad when we came to New York to Broadway. I mean, and they mainly didn't like the, uh, it's a little too complicated for me to get into right now, the problems of that Broadway production. But we were together, just the two of us, for a year. And it was, a, it was for me, I mean, I'm still wearing sandals and beads around my neck. Right. I got a, a, an army surplus canvas bag with my belongings in it. You know, I don't own a coat, a sport coat. <laughs> and uh, they, uh, I've written about this. I wrote a, a, a memoir about it, which has been published. Uh, uh, and... Uh, Suddenly, there I am on the road with this this movie star, this TV star, you know, and um, riding first class. Always, he insisted that I I ride first class, since he was riding first class, and um, he was very generous to me, very generous. He was a Sicilian, you know. He was from his his roots were in Sicily, mm -hmm. and uh, um, he was a macho guy. Yeah, you know, he wasn't all that tall. He was very strong. He drank a lot. He gambled. He 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 loved women. He could be loud and kind of uh, perhaps uh, seen as obnoxious. But I love the guy, you know. And um, I've had a lot of difficult friends. I've had I've had friends. I've been friends with people who a lot of people couldn't tolerate. Well, I've been married to a woman that nobody could understand why I was with her. 
because right. they found her so difficult. And I, I said, that's my business, you know. Why I, why I, why I love someone is my business. Yeah, you know? sure. Yeah, and it's very complex, and it's, uh, it's got a lot to do with a lot of things. So it's not easy to explain or talk about. But he was wonderful in the part, very generous to me always. Uh, and it was amazing to watch him. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in that play, if you know Huey by O'Neill, you know that play of O'Neill's? Yeah. Yes. You know, the man behind the hotel desk and the yeah. uh, gambler, the small time nice. gambler. Yeah. You know. um, it was amazing to watch him on stage. He was so wonderful. But it was all fun to play with him. Fun, absolute fun. Yes. But it was also then, you know, because we were the two of us on the road, you know, I, I couldn't just say goodnight at the end of the show and go to my hotel, which was not as fancy as his hotel. Right. He wouldn't let me do that. Right. You know, the limousine would be waiting outside the theater. We'd come out and he'd shove me into the limo and tell the driver where we're going. And we'd, you know, park party, uh, party or go dancing or something until till practically dawn every night, you know. Right. It was an exciting uh, life. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, I really thought the world of him. Um, and as I say, I've written about it in this, I, in this lengthy piece. And Casavetti's worked in that film too, right? So, uh, what? Oh, then you're talking about, yeah, oh, this is funny. So anyway, so mm -hmm. while, we, so we go to California and we have a hiatus between engagements. So I was there for quite a while. And um, so we did this movie together. Mm -hmm. home. Yeah. He also directed me in the Columbo, a oh. two hour Columbo that cost a couple of million dollars to make that one episode. It was on a ship. Right. It was on a, a, a cruise ship with 1500 passengers. <laughs> and so um, uh, that was fun. That was a, that was a two weeks on the high seas wow. shooting this uh, movie for Universal, this Colombo movie, and that was great. Um, but also, so he, so uh, this guy uh, offers him this this um, Capone movie. Uh, somehow produced or executive produced by Roger Corman. Mm -hmm. uh, I frankly can't remember right off the top of my head the, the name of the director, uh, young man. Um, Was it James Kahn? Huh? No, no, no. That's uh, that's a different movie. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> so anyway, there we are doing this movie. Now he's got he's managed so the, the, these guys are. Uh, how to describe it? Um, they're like a little society, all their own. We're talking about Cassavetes, yeah. oh. Gazzara, uh, Peter Falk. And so, you know, there's a closeness there. So Ben gets everybody that he likes in the movie with him. He gets Cassavetes uh, to be in it. He gets me to be in it. As Grace, Jake Greasy Thumb Guzik, accountant to the mob, and he's playing Capone. And Sylvester Stallone is playing Frank Nitti. <laughs> and um, Sylvester and I are sitting there for weeks. We shot it on all the back lots of every major studio, all those old 1930s storefronts and, you know, that old New York look um and we're sitting there in our chairs now sylvester when we go to see the dailies um to see what was shot yesterday we go to yeah. see him. it's fun to go i love to go it doesn't bother me to see myself you know i'm never particularly thrilled with myself uh, in that in these things anyway but it didn't bother me and I, what, what could i say uh, but um, I have a tendency, because of my training with Uta Hagen, four years with Uta Hagen, oh, we, yeah. I'm a properties actor. In other words, the way you know, if, uh, if you see a, somebody heading toward Bank Street with, with about four shopping bags, 
full of props. Right. You know, that's an Uta Hagen student. Right. Because she teaches you how to, in a, in a black box kind of a bare bones classroom, to set it up with your things that mean a lot to you, your properties, the things that you need to use for the scene, mm -hmm. to serve you, the actor, your inner life. Right. So I'm that kind of an actor. So, uh, and I wasn't that experienced with doing movies. You know, I'd only done a few movies in my life. And so I'm using objects all the time, you know, I'm using objects, you know. I'm, I'm playing a guy who I, we imagine has got an ulcer and I saw so him drinking milk. And I smoke nonstop, we all smoke nonstop and I've got a box of cigarettes. So I'm smoking, I'm lighting cigarettes, I'm drinking milk, you know. So we go to the, we, we go to the dailies after the scene of consultation about what are we going to do about those Brooklyn mob guys who are trying to encroach on our territory or whatever the hell the subject was. It was not a very good script. And um, so Harry Guardino, who's another friend of Gazzara's, another Italian, another member of the club, so to speak, right. is just the head of the table. And he's doing, he's got the main part of the scene. And there I am drinking my milk. You know, and Gardino says, Maloney, what the hell are you doing? He's watching me up there. He had not noticed it during the shooting of the scene, but you can't, you can't miss me. I'm down in the, <clears throat> as you're facing the screen, I'm down in the left corner at the table with my milk <laughs> and my cigarettes and my cigarette lighter. And probably I've got all my account books here too, ready to call up the numbers if, if Al asks me uh, what, you know, what the financial situation is. And I'm working with my props. So <clears throat> I get the nickname busy, 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 because I'm so busy. And I had to stop that behavior. I had to watch it. I don't think I was very successful in stopping, it. you know, quietness, the knowledge that you don't have to do anything but be truly there yeah. for your partner in a scene and you will be absolutely right on in the movie that that takes that quieting down uh is a very important for any actor to if you're going to be in a movie especially for me i'm a hyper guy anyway i'm too loud like my father i'm like my father i mean i'm a loud guy i'm loud yeah it's very hard for me to be not animated mm -hmm. you know what i mean it's very hard sure yeah. it took me a little, years years before i ever saw myself on the screen and said well boy that was really nice you know i really somehow achieved a kind of state of being as the I, character it was very so, helpful very yeah. helpful to the scene so, and so. um so anyway so so yeah. Then comes the, 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 in the dailies, there comes Sylvester Stallone during the scene. Oh. Okay. And I say, is that, <clears throat> is that a still photograph? I say in the thing out loud, I say, is that a still <clears throat> I say, Sly, we call them Sly. I say, Sly, is that a still? You know, it's not. It's not. Yeah. Well, of course, he has a bit of a problem. I think the lower part of his face is paralyzed from an accident or something. Yes. Right. So, um, so we each had our problem in the in the work, and we're sitting in a, outside uh, in our chairs, you know, and uh, for weeks. And one day, Sylvester says to me, Peter. Yeah, I wrote a screenplay. Oh, wow. I said, oh, good for you, man. Now, I'd written a couple of screenplays, not very good. But I was always pleased to know that somebody's got more talent than acting. And I said, wonderful, wonderful. What's it about? It's about a boxer. <laughs> and I said to myself, 
what an idiot. <laughs> say, boxer, boxer, what do you mean boxer? Nobody watches boxing anymore. My father used to take us down to my grandfather's house to watch the Friday night fights, but that was in the 50s. You know, <laughs> we're talking, this, this is 1974. Yeah. And he said, uh, I said, oh, terrific, thinking this is going to go nowhere. Right. He said, yeah, yeah. Uh, I just uh, turned down uh, uh, $250,000 to sell the script. I said, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I said, well, why'd you do that? He says, well, because I'm going to play the lead or it's not going to get me. Wow. And I thought to myself, what an idiot! <laughs> not only is he writing a script about a subject that no one is interested in, yeah. mm -hmm. hasn't been for decades, he's now going to insist that he play the lead, which is nobody's going to let him do it. Okay, I said, well, it's great, good luck with it. He said, yeah, I wrote a part for my dog, too. <laughs> I say, oh, good. So I just wrote it off. I mean, I just said, right. forget about it. But I'm an idiot. I'm the idiot because I don't see, you know, I, I can't put these things together, you know. And so then when, when he was, I remember being at the Cedar Tavern on the University in the city where I spent a lot of time between marriages. Um, and I remember that, watching the Oscars there when it won Best Picture, and I was so happy for him, you know what I mean? It was just unbelievable. It won Best Picture. Best Picture. Rocky won. I don't know that we needed Rocky 9. Uh, right, right. Yeah. Was, or even 8, 7, or 6, or 5. I don't know, but it's a franchise, man. It was, it was definitely a lucrative franchise, for sure, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What? It was definitely lucrative for Sylvester Stallone. It, it made him a lot of money. Oh, yeah. But it also, you know, there's a, a real example of, it's like Vin Diesel, who I was in, in um, Boiler Room with Vin Diesel. Oh, yeah, yes. Reco, the Reco scene. Yeah, yeah. He's selling, trying to sell me th uh, the 2,000 shares of uh, Bitcoin stock. For J.T. Marlin. Uh, the what? That was the name of the brokerage company in that movie, J.T. Marlin. Uh, yeah. Marlin? J.T. Marlin, yeah. I know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, but I mean, I think there's a, a problem with being too successful in the sense that uh, God knows I wished I'd had more money many times during my career. But um, to, be, uh, to have that franchise be the thing you're known for, it's hard to do anything else. Yeah, yeah. You know, because even though they might want you, they say, He's, I don't know, Dave, you know, I love him. He's a wonderful actor. But, you know, when they see him up there, all they're going to think of is that thing that made him so rich. Right. Movie after movie after movie in the same character. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, I, I hear you, yeah. Sure. Uh, we're, we're running out of time for this edition. We have a few more minutes left, though. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask you about um, uh, um, voodoo dolls. Yeah. Um, you're, you're a fan of voodoo dolls. Have you collected voodoo dolls in the past? Occultist? What are you talking yeah. about? Is that also from the I Am the Machine? Yeah. That, was in a, that was in a different article we researched. Yeah. yeah. Is no. Okay. Okay. Moving along. Wow. And like that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. That was pretty definite. No. How old am I and where was I born? Yes. Okay. I don't know where people get this stuff, man. That's beautiful. Uh, well, perhaps we could ask one more question Indeed. for now. Uh, just curious um, about the movie you did in 1982, The Thing. Yes, that was the greatest <laughs> job of my life. Say it again? Pardon? That was the greatest job of my life. Was it really? Oh, wow. Okay. There you go. I'm glad I asked. No, I it, got, it got me out of debt for the first time in my adult life. Ah. It was a six-month shoot. Yes. I was one of maybe three guys that they flew out from New York. And because we were from New York, we got paid. We got a car. Mm -hmm. We got per diem. Yes. For six months. Wow. I never had to get, I didn't have to cash a, a paycheck. Jesus. You nice. live off the per diem. Right. Wow. And, and the car is, is mine while I'm there, you know. 
So it was a, it was a wonderful job, you know. Uh, uh, and I was, it was a bad time. Um, um, I was not getting any work at all. And um, I was about to leave my agent. And uh, I've never been very good at, I don't like change. You know, I'm a, I don't like change. And I resist it. Right. And I only had two agents, you know, in all my years, 53 years in New York, I only lived in two places. That's unusual. Yeah. I don't like to move. I only had two agents. I don't like to change. Mm -hmm. So this agent, I should have left a couple of times because of things that happened. But I always said, if I leave this agent, eventually the same thing is going to happen with this new agent. You know, so what's the point? So I was thinking of leaving this agent and go, trying a new somebody. The other thing is I'm lazy. I don't, I'm sort of happy not working. Yes, yes. Um, I, I, I was very competitive in college. And I suppose maybe my first few years in New York, I was competitive, but right. I lost that competitive sense, you know, right. and, um, and began, and, 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 and I've always been happy in the work, interested in what I'm doing and happy doing it. Um, unless it's, I, I mistakenly end up working for an asshole, you know, then I'm not happy. That right. doesn't happen very often. And, um, so, um, I went into my agent and I said to this woman who I really liked her a lot, this woman who worked in the agency. And I said, I really think I'm going to be leaving the agency and going to somebody else. And she says, don't do it yet. I think you're going to get an offer for that science fiction movie that you auditioned. And sure enough, within a week, I got this call. And, um, you know, uh, I was thrilled to be cast. I was thrilled with the guys. I, I've written about this as well. I took, I kept a journal during the entire shoot, both in Los Angeles and up on the glacier in um, south of Juneau, Alaska. Um, and I thought I was going to write a book because we all thought this was going to be a big hit. Universal thought it was going to pull them out of the cellar. They were in such trouble. They had banners across the the main entry to Universal Studios in the Valley saying, thank you to John Carpenter's The Thing. <laughs> yeah. And um, so, um, and that turned out to be, it turned out to be a, a flop, the film was a, a, a pretty much a total flop has become over the decades a kind of a cult film. Yeah. yeah. And with a huge audience, a great, a great audience. And, but it, it really hurt our director. It hurt John Carpenter's career. He, I don't think he made a film in the next five years. Right. Um, uh, it, it just um, went nowhere because of bad timing, you know. And uh, E.T. opened up a few weeks before us. E.T. Right. And everybody wanted a sweet little ugly little alien. They didn't sure. want sure. grotesque monsters that could really hurt you. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Interesting. But it was a long, it was a long shoot yeah. and a wonderful time. Uh, the, one of the main things about it was that my wife, I said to my girlfriend at the time, the woman I was in love with, I said, um, we each had an apartment in New York, although we spent most of the time at her place. And um, I said, let's, I'm, I got this movie, six months, it's going to be, I'm going to be working. And why don't we, you, you come out with me and we'll see if we can live together. So she said, okay, so we rented, a, sublet a, an apartment from a friend. And then uh, Kristen and I lived together during the shoot. Yeah. She did plays down in San Diego. We did episodic TV. Right. Uh, and um, I proposed to her as soon as the shoot was over. Beautiful. Yeah. And on that note, yeah. we're um, gonna... Will you come back for part two next week? If you have time, I'll call you in between. Sure, I, I love talking. Yeah, I love talking. It's hard to shut me up. Okay.
good. Oh, which we love too. Yeah. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, Peter. We'll, we'll, be in, we'll be in touch soon. We haven't even got to my Irish rep here. I know. I know. We're so excited. We might need, it might need to be a three-part thing. It, it might need three. We might need three parts. Look, this is the first play I did at the Irish rep. This is Ernest in Love. Picture. That's my wife playing Miss Prism. Oh, wow. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Boom. Yeah. Yes. Classic. But okay. look at this. Wait, look at this. Okay. This is my father in 19... In the 1920s. Brilliant. Whoa. With my godmother. Is that and a, it's from the play uh, Trilby. Trilby by De Maurier. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, nice. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thank yeah. you, Peter. We'll talk to you soon, yeah. Peter. We'll talk to you soon. Anyway, it's fun. It's yes. fun. We're talking. Yes. We'll see you next time. We, we'll we'll see you soon. I'll be, I'll be Great. Are you off to do another one? Yes, yeah, we, we have to, yeah. We're on a, yeah, we're doing another one right now. We're, Yes, with Mr. Shanley. Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. I have, uh, it's been fun, and I look forward to doing more. Yeah. Absolutely. Sorry about the, the difficulty of the hookup. But no worries. Absolutely. Thank okay. you so much. We'll talk soon. All right. See you soon. Be well. Okay, Cheers. Bye.